Hello and welcome back to our next session. Since we just finished Judaism, we are now moving to Christianity. I tried to find a nice spot where I could find some water. I was hoping for some boats on there, but uh, um, couldn't find that during this time of coronavirus. However, I thought it would be a perfect spot to be here as we know those romantic stories about Jesus walking along the seashore of Lake Gennesareth looking for the fishermen that are mending their nets at the shore or calling them away from their boats to follow him. And so I thought that maybe being here in Sea Caucus on the Hackensack River, it would be a perfect spot to take this lesson. Thank you also for uh, responding to my questions um, looking forward to this session. The two questions about who do you think the founder of Christianity is and, uh, and what religion Jesus practiced. I will give you the results once all of this is tabulated and I will put that into the lesson. But right at the beginning we can ask the question what religion did Jesus practice? Some of you answered that he was born a Jew and died a Jew and never intended anything different. Some of you speculated that maybe Jesus uh, was born a Jewish person and uh, became a Christian during his lifetime. Some of you thought that maybe uh, since he was preaching Christianity that he was a Christian all along. Well, maybe this lesson will give you a little bit more insight. Towards the end when you respond, you can reconsider this again and ask the question again, what religion was Jesus? So let's consider who Jesus was. Most of us are familiar with the Jesus we know from the Bible. But we have to consider that those stories that we read in the Bible are already the interpretations of the followers of Jesus. Most of the stories we know from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and they were written later. For example, Mark was written shortly before the Jewish war started, around 60, 65, maybe even 66, right at the beginning of the war. Matthew and Luke and John were written after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. At the time, there were already people that called themselves Christians, and those gospels were written to people that had already started believing in Jesus as the Messiah and as uh, the leader for the new movement of Christianity. So the Gospels are already uh, documents of faith, not necessarily historic Gospels. Consider this for example. You probably know the story of Christmas and of the birth of Jesus. Well, the first thing to know is that this, the birth story only appears in Matthew and in Luke. There is no birth story in the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel, and there is no birth story in the Gospel of John, the latest Gospel. But even the two stories in Matthew and Luke do not necessarily agree with each other. For example, in Matthew we hear that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, just like in Luke, and that there were some um, wise men or uh, magi, and we kind of thought that maybe there are Zoroastrian priests, that they had interpreted the star and came all the way to, to Israel to find the newborn king. They're going to Jerusalem first to knock on Herod's door, and Herod is all surprised when they're saying, oh, welcome, we hear that you have a new baby. And Herod says, uh, new baby? I don't have one, no. And he wanted to inquire what they figured out and what this was all about. So after the after the research, they found out that maybe the newborn king was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And remember, Bethlehem is the place where David came from, King David. But that aside, so the wise men are going and are finding Jesus in, in Bethlehem. And then afterwards, they are told by an angel to go directly back and not to go back to Herod because Herod was after the life of the child. And then Joseph gets a dream um, uh, where he also is asked to leave, to, to pick up Mary and, uh, and the child and to escape to Egypt. And there they are in Egypt. 
And some of you who know the Christmas story are probably wondering, well, what about the shepherds, for example? Where are they? And what about the uh, baby lying in a manger and being wrapped in swaddling cloth? Well, that story we know from the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke, we do not know about King Herod and about the wise men. So in Luke, uh, Mary and Joseph are going to uh, follow the census in Bethlehem. They're coming also to Bethlehem. And, uh, they don't find any room in the inn, and so they are going out into the stable, and that's when Mary gives birth to Jesus. And the news is being spread first to the, by the angels to the shepherds in the field, who then come in and uh, find the baby Jesus and are uh, adoring the baby Jesus. Right after that, we hear that Mary and Joseph are going into the temple eight days later in Jerusalem to sacrifice two turtle doves and to present a child in the temple, probably also to do the circumcision. Here we know that Mary and Joseph are following the Jewish laws, the way that uh, a good practicing Jew is supposed to do. And they're, they're sacrificing two turtle doves instead of a ram, which normally would have been the practice to do after the firstborn child um, after the firstborn child. Luke indicates with that that Mary and Joseph were of poor estate, that they couldn't afford buying a uh, ram. Of course, this goes back to the story in Genesis 22, where Isaac is spared sacrifice and um, Abraham can sacrifice a an, an ram instead. And so Mary and Joseph are doing that practice. They're sacrificing the poor man's uh, sacrifice to turtle doves. Now, both of those things would be difficult to harmonize. How can Jesus and Mary and Joseph be in the temple in Jerusalem eight days after the birth if in the other story, Joseph is being told by an, by an angel to escape to Egypt? Those two possible things would not be really possible. Well, what that tells us is that it's not that they are wrong. They may not be historically accurate, but Matthew and Luke are telling important stories. Matthew is trying to make a point that Jesus is the new Moses. He is in Egypt. The next thing that happens after he comes back from Egypt is that he's getting baptized, just like the people of Israel when they escaped from Egypt had to go through the water, you know, through the parting of the sea. And then uh, right after the baptism, Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Well, just like the Israelites were wandering through the desert for uh, 40 years. Like, so Matthew is trying to make the point that Jesus is the new Moses. Luke, on the other hand, is trying to make another point. Luke is the one who writes the gospel uh, to bring hope to the poor. So the message first goes to the poorest of the poor, out for the shepherds in the field. Then they're coming to the temple and they're sacrificing as faithful Jewish people, um, but the poor man sacrifice. So here's a different emphasis and a different message that Luke is trying to give about who this person is that he's going to be writing about. So if the Gospels have not intended to actually write history, to record a biography of Jesus, then how do we know anything about the life of Jesus as an historic person? Well, one thing in the Gospels that is pretty, pretty clear in all four Gospels the same story is that story about Jesus' passion and his crucifixion on the cross. And there we also have some evidence from outside of the Christian community from other historians. Here we're meeting Josephus again, from whom we heard about already on the different Jewish groups. And Josephus uh, mentions Jesus in three different places. For example, um, here he writes, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was the doer of wonder, wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And then I put into parentheses here, he was the Christ. Uh, that is probably a later addition by Christian writers who added that in. And when Pilate, as at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again uh, the third day. And the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named for him, 
are not extinct at this day. This comes from Josephus in the um, uh, Antiquities of the Jews in book number 18. So what we have here is, at least in the first passage, a documentation from the Jewish historian Josephus that Jesus was crucified and that he was judged by Pontius Pilate. But there's also another passage in the Annals uh, by Tacitus in book 15, towards the end in the, in the 44th chapter, it says, Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most ex exquisite torture on a class hated by their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our uh, procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. So we can say with some security that uh, Jesus as a historic person did exist, that he is mentioned outside of the scriptures of faith in historians um, and non-Christian writings, um, and that this person Jesus was historically crucified. But what led to that? And who was Jesus within the um, mix of all the different uh, groups that were there, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, uh, the Sicarii. Where did Jesus fit in? Um, with whom was he aligned or who was he against? And what exactly led to his death? To answer that question, we can consult the Gospels, even though they are written later and they are uh, not necessarily historic documents, but we do find the discussions and the debates that were going on uh, pretty well documented in them. And it's interesting that all these groups that we talked about, we can find in the Gospels and in the New Testament. The Pharisees, right? They're coming up 88 times in the New Testament. They are also oftentimes called the teachers of the law. And we understand that now, right? Because we know that the Pharisees were the teachers of the law. They were um, at the temple. They were the teachers, the rabbis, out of which then comes the rabbinical tradition. The Sadducees themselves are mentioned 14 times in the New Testament, but oftentimes they're also mentioned as the chief priests. Chief priests is mentioned 64 times in the New Testament. So between the 14 and the 64, uh, we have the Sadducees also appearing about 78 times in the New Testament. And oftentimes they are coupled with the Pharisees. It's either the Pharisees and Sadducees that are being mentioned, or it is the Pharisees and the chief priests, um, or it may be the teachers of the law and uh, the chief priests or the scribes, which also the Pharisees often signs are. Um, so they are mentioned and oftentimes together, but also sometimes separate because Jesus could uh, split them sometimes. In moments day, he, um, he tried to split them in arguments because he knew that the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, the Pharisees did. And uh, Jesus used that sometimes. But in any case, we know for sure that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were his enemies. So if Jesus was not a Pharisee or Sadducee, then what was he? Well, there's an interesting note that uh, one of, it, of Jesus' uh, disciples, Simon, is called Simon the Zealot. That's not Simon Peter, that's another Simon, but he's called the Simon the Zealot. Um, he appears in each one of the Gospels one time and one time in the book of Acts. Interesting, right? That Jesus has one of the Zealots among his disciples. Well, what about the Essenes? They are actually never mentioned by name in the Bible. Um, however, John the Baptist kind of behaves like an Essene. Uh, he is living an ascetic life, right? He is out in the wilderness. He comes to the River Jordan to baptize, which is something that the Essenes did. Um, and when he preached uh, to the people to come and uh, turn around, uh, we know that he was dressed with camel's hair and uh, ate only locusts, so he lived that ascetic life. 
And then the story is that Jesus came down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. There's actually the connection made that John is a cousin of Jesus, about six months older. Um, and so one wonders, you know, is Jesus an, an Essene? That might be a nice thought, however, what speaks against that is that while John the Baptist was uh, eating only locusts and uh, was uh, uh, living a very ascetic life, Jesus was the opposite. We hear Jesus when he was going around to preach, always sitting at feasts and eating and having meals and uh, drinking wine and doing all these wonderful things. That is not exactly the lifestyle of a Essene. So then what was Jesus? If he wasn't an Essene, but had roots among the Essenes, um, if he caused a zealot to be one of his disciples, what was he? Maybe this indicates that Jesus was actually developing his own movement, especially at the time when people expected under harsh uh, op um, oppression from the Romans, that hopefully soon there will be a new Messiah who would liberate uh, Israel from the oppression of the Romans and would re-establish the Davidic kingdom. And the expectation of a new Messiah was great during that time. That's why the Zealots liked it, right? They were thinking that the new Messiah would come and Simon the Zealot probably believed that Jesus was the one who, who would come and who would uh, kick some Roman butt. Well, but Jesus was not a fighter. Jesus is telling his disciples that when somebody slaps you on the right cheek, give him the other one too. Or if a Roman soldier comes around and asks you know, to walk one mile with them, go two miles with them. Another time Jesus is being asked, you know, whom they should pay taxes to. And Jesus says, well, what's on the, what's on the coin? And they said, well, this, uh, it's the image of Caesar. And then he says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what belongs to God. So Jesus was not exactly a zealot. But what we can say is that Jesus certainly developed his own movement. Jesus was offended by the way that the Sadducees and uh, Pharisees were leading the worship in the temple. He thought that the strict adherence by the Pharisees to the law and the expectation that if um, all Jewish people would keep the, the, the written and oral Torah uh, completely perfectly for one full day, that then the Messiah would return, that that would be, was a mistake. So what then is the main conflict between the Pharisees and Sadducees on one side and Jesus on the other side? It seems to be a discussion about how to interpret the law, the Torah, or the instructions. Of course, we know that the Sadducees and Pharisees don't necessarily agree because um, the Pharisees believe both in the uh, uh, Torah and the Mishnah, right, the oral tradition as well, whereas the Sadducees believe only in the uh, written Torah. But they're both interpreting them pretty strictly. And uh, we already learned about the Sabbath laws and about the food laws that everyone had to keep. And for Jesus, that meant that many people were excluded. Many people could not come and participate in the worship in the temple because for some reason or another, they were ritually unclean. That included when you were sick. When you were sick, you were not clean. That's why Jesus many times says to people when after he heals them, go show yourselves to the priests, because the priests had to um, testify to the fact that they are again admitted to the temple. During that time, there were also people that were eunuchs, right? Um, a eunuch is someone who is uh, castrated, and therefore that person can never be spiritually clean again to be worshipping in a temple. And so the temple worship excluded many people. It was also difficult to keep that, to keep this rule. It was expensive as well. If you lived a little bit further away, maybe two or three days away, you had to first make, it, make the time that you had to walk down to the temple to fulfill your sacrificial duties. And you couldn't bring your own animal with you over this journey because it could hit, hit itself on some rock or so and therefore be damaged because the sacrificial animal had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect, totally perfect. And so when somebody traveled to the temple, they had to come, make the time first to come all the way to Jerusalem. Once they arrived in Jerusalem, 
they would have to find a place to stay. That means they would have to pay for a um, hotel in the ancient ver old version of that, right? After they did that, they would have to cleanse themselves first. In Jerusalem, there were many pools. Um, people had to wash themselves there first before they were admitted to the temple. And do you think that was free? No, people had to pay for that, right? Then they had to come into the temple and the first thing they had to do in the temple is to buy them, buy their own animal. But what do you buy it with? Because if you came from outside of Jerusalem, you probably did not have the temple currency in your pocket. You had some kind of other money. So the first thing that you had to do in the temple is to exchange your money. And once you exchanged your money, and of course those money changes also charged a nice fee for the exchange, right? Then you went to buy an animal from one of the other vendors that were uh, set up in the outskirts of the temple there. And that's where you bought your animal. Then you took the animal and you brought it to the priest who took it, who slaughtered it, and um, sacrificed the fat and uh, some other portions that were burned on the altar on your behalf. Um, another part of that animal was retained as payment for the priests. And then you yourself and your family were given back another portion of the animal that now you could partake from. Eating part of the sacrificial animal was um, part of how the sacrifice would be beneficial for you. You partake, you eat of the sacrifice. But you had to do that someplace, right? So you had to go um, to Jerusalem, to your place, and uh, find a place where you can prepare a meal. Of course, that costs money too, right? Um, and then once you're finished with all of that, uh, you finally can go home again. But by that time, you probably spend a lot of time and uh, you spend a lot of money um, doing all these things that needed to be done. So if you were not excluded on some other basis that you were unclean for some reason, you might be excluded from this because you were poor and couldn't afford all this. And for Jesus, that was not the intention of the covenants that God had made with uh, Abraham and with Noah. In Jesus' mind, these covenants were there for God to make a bond with God's people and that God would always be there for people. And so for Jesus, fulfilling the law was not to keep it um, to the T and the literal part of the law, but it was to live out the spirit of the law, to have a relationship, um, a loving relationship with God, a trusting relationship with God, where God would come and extend God's self to you when you were in trouble. And so we have stories where Jesus heals people on the Sabbath. The Pharisees get all upset because they want to keep the Sabbath law, right? Um, you cannot heal somebody on the Sabbath, that's work. But for Jesus, it was more important to restore that person to health, that that would be the thing that God would do and would renew the relationship. And so for Jesus, it was about healing right now, right then, when there was the opportunity, never mind that it was the Sabbath. You might see that distinction between the keeping the letter of the law as the Pharisees saw it and as the Sadducees reinforced versus living the spirit of the law as Jesus saw it um, as the difference between obedience theology um, as the Pharisees practiced it versus covenant theology the way Jesus was preaching it. And so doing his ministry for three years as he walked around the countryside and came down to Jerusalem, uh, he had collected all these different disciples who had different kinds of expectations of him, who did not necessarily always understand what Jesus was all about. Um, they expected that Jesus would be the Messiah that would restore the kingdom of Israel, uh, that he would be the one who would kick out the Romans. Um, whereas Jesus really had more of an argument within Judaism itself. Um, Jesus was really not so much about whether the government was an occupying force. And so during his last days, um, he's going with his disciples to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem.
Now, remember Passover is the celebration for the Jews of uh, freedom from oppression. And of course, the Romans were not stupid. They knew that they were the occupiers at this point. They were like the Pharaoh in Egypt and that the Jews always hoped for the kind of exodus and freedom again. And so the Romans made sure that uh, there wouldn't be any kind of uprisings and so on during this time of Passover. So before Jesus arrived, shortly before Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, the normal kinds of things happened where Pontius Pilate, the governor in Jerusalem, reinforced the Roman troops in Jerusalem. And in order for everybody to see that uh, there is now reinforcement, the Pontius Pilate would ride into Jerusalem on a horse uh, with all the soldiers following him, uh, triumphantly walking, riding into the city of Jerusalem so that everybody would see, you know, don't even start anything during this time. You see that there are more soldiers now, right? Well, what does Jesus do? He is mocking Pontius Pilate. Because right after this um, band of soldiers with Pontius Pilate leading us uh, has come in, uh, here comes Jesus. He is asking for a small little donkey, right? Not necessarily a war animal, right? It's not a horse. A donkey is more of a peaceful animal. So he takes a donkey, he puts his cloaks on there, he sits on this donkey just like um, the governor was sitting on the horse before. And then behind him is this throng of poor people, of people that were healed, of people that were having great hopes that finally maybe um, this oppression will be over. And people stood on the sides, they broke off branches from the trees around and wa waved them around and said, Hosanna to the son of David. Um, Hosanna to the, to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, we don't know whether that's historic, of course, um, this is the story of the Gospels, but Hosanna to the son of David is an ind indication for the king, uh, that there will be a new king of Israel. But in any case, it must have gotten the attention of the authorities that uh, Jesus was mocking uh, and mockingly coming in, but there was a great crowd behind him, and so they kept quiet. But what does Jesus do next? He goes, in, goes into the temple. And in the temple, he sees all these money changers and the uh, vendors of animals. And he goes in, he makes a whip of cord and throws them all out. Now he's causing a ruckus in the temple. The Pharisees don't like it. The Sadducees don't like it that he's making this ruckus. The Roman authorities are worried that he's starting something. Um, but they're still holding quiet because there is too much of a crowd that is behind Jesus. Then we hear that Jesus kind of retreats. He goes back to Bethany about uh, um, a little bit outside of Jerusalem. That's where he's staying overnight with uh, his good friends Mary and Martha and, uh, and Lazarus. And then the next day he comes back to Jerusalem. He's asking his disciples to find the place where they can have the Passover. They're preparing the Passover um, and during that last Passover meal, Jesus is taking the bread and he breaks the bread and he says the blessing the way he would, you would do at the Passover meal. But he adds interesting things to it. He says that this is my body that will be broken soon and that it will be given for the world. And then during the Passover there are usually four cups and then there comes the fifth cup at the end which is the cup of Elijah. And so Jesus takes that last cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. It is a sin offering that is supposed to take away the sins of the people that is performed in the temple. And an animal has to be sacrificed for that. If Jesus now takes the bread and says that it's his body, and that they are drinking of his blood, then he, become, he becomes the sacrificial animal. He becomes the sacrifice through which the sin of the world is taken away. It doesn't quite make sense for the disciples yet. Uh, they're just wondering what was going on. Um, Judas had enough and he's leaving and uh, is beginning to tell on Jesus to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the rest of the disciples and Jesus go outside of Jerusalem to the uh, Mount of Olives, uh, where we hear in the Gospels that Jesus was praying earnestly. And eventually the soldiers are coming and arresting him in the garden. So he's brought in front of the Sanhedrin, the, the um, 
council of judges of the Sadducees and Pharisees. And we know the story that he then eventually gets um, um, judged, sentenced. The Pharisees and Sadducees are accusing him in front of Pontius Pilate that he is claiming to be the king of the Jews. And so Jesus is crucified. A crucifixion wasn't anything unusual at the time. It was the punishment for anybody who claimed to be a messiah. It was the punishment for anybody who stood up against Rome. Um, even though Jesus wasn't really standing up against Rome, he was standing up against the pra Jewish practices of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the Romans wouldn't have any interest in that. And for the Pharisees and Sadducees to get rid of Jesus, they accused him that he is claiming to be the new king of Israel. And so uh, he gets crucified. Well, with the death of Jesus, that would have meant the death of the movement. Right? But here we are touching the one historic thing, and that is that he died on the cross as a traitor against Rome. That's what we know from Josephus and from Tacitus even outside of the Bible. And for most people, this will be the end of that new movement that Jesus had started. What comes next is really something that can only be described by faith. The body was taken off the cross. It was laid into a tomb, which was kind of unusual actually, because normally bodies would kept, be kept on the, the crosses until scavengers and birds and so on would have all eaten up and uh, eaten up the bodies. Nicodemus, who was also a Pharisee, uh, he actually made available a tomb in which they laid Jesus. It was just short, like, shortly before the evening, before sundown, before the Sabbath or the Passover would start. And so um, they didn't do anything of the normal funeral kind of preparations. They couldn't do anything the next day on the Sabbath and on uh, Sunday morning. Very early we hear the story that some of the women would come out to do the um, last burial rites that one was supposed to be doing. And they discover an empty tomb. And they're running and telling the disciples and the other disciples and they're coming and everybody sees that there's an empty tomb. Well, what would you make out of that if you were told that the tomb is empty? Would you immediately believe that Jesus was raised? I think the more normal conclusion would be that somebody stole the body. Somebody took him away. Well, the Gospel writers are trying to counter that argument by saying that there was a big stone in front of it and that they put soldiers up there so that nobody could have come to steal the body. But it is still ultimately a, uh, a belief that they saw Jesus afterwards, that they saw the risen Jesus. There are several stories, they're varying in the different Gospels about how, they, how people see him, but there seems to be something that has encouraged this movement that was totally beaten down and thought that this was the end, that got new hope, and that they somehow got the idea that it's now up to them to carry on. Here's a shift between what we normally call the, the disciples, who are the followers of Jesus. Disciples are learners or students that still are learning and have learned from Jesus all along throughout the time of his mission. To the shift where they now become the leaders and the teachers, they become the sent ones, the apostles. And so here is the nucleus of the first new movement. They're still Jewish. Right? They're gathering in Jerusalem. They're still going up to the temple. But they are excited about a new time and about a new understanding. And so they carry it on. And we hear in the end of the Gospel of Luke and the beginning of the book of Acts that they are being inspired, that the Holy Spirit comes down on them, that they are being inspired um, to carry on the, the message, message and teachings of Jesus. And here we will stop the story of Jesus. Just to consider again. First of all, the question, right? What religion is Jesus? What do you think? Respond when, you, when it's your turn to respond. Another question would be, would you consider the new, the, the apostles, the, 
the people that saw the risen Christ, would you consider them Christians already? So the next question is, for the next session, how then did this Jesus movement within Judaism change over into what we know as Christianity? How did that happen? Wait till the next lesson when we talk about that. <laughs>